Welcome to our video history. Today we're fortunately to have with us Dr. John Shera, who is a former president of FIGO, an active member of the college, and John, if I may call you Jack, as we usually do, thank you very much for being here. Well, thanks, Ralph, for the invitation. Uh, let's begin with a little of your background first, so that people get to know you a little better and understand. Where were you born? Well, as I think you know, I'm from New England. I was born in Connecticut and had my early schooling there and went to Yale uh, and uh, from then on to Columbia for medical school. And then I guess the rest is OBGYN. What uh, influenced you in your life so that you wanted to become a physician? You know, that's a good question and it's one that I've, I've often asked myself. Uh, when I went to college, and as you probably remember, in, uh, in the late 40s and the 50s, you went to college and you were sort of undifferentiated, unlike today, where people sort of already have their career path clearly outlined when they go to college. Uh, I knew I wanted to do something in science, and uh, I gravitated toward uh, biology and then went uh, into the pre-med program and uh, went on to medical school. So it started with science, and then of the options open in science, I thought medicine was probably the, the right career for me, and obviously it was a good choice. Once you were in medical school, you had to choose a postgraduate training in a, or a residency. Why did you choose OBGYN? You know, it's, it's the same uh, analysis that I just gave you in terms of, of college. Um, and when I went to medical school, probably when you went to medical school, um, most of us were uh, un undifferentiated when we started to school. And uh, at Columbia, uh, I was very influenced by Professor Howard Taylor, uh, who uh, at that point was very active in terms of uh, teaching and gave many of the lectures to us as undergraduates in our third year. and. And that's when I sort of decided that I, I wanted to do um, uh, obstetrics. Uh, although I must say, initially my interest was in surgery. And I took a, an internship in surgery at Yale uh, before going back to Columbia for a residency in obstetrics and gynecology. Once you finished your residency, you obviously had many choices as to where you would go. What influenced you into your ultimate decision? Well, uh, my residency was, was quite long because I took uh, time off during the residency uh, as a Macy Fellow to get a PhD at Columbia. Uh, so I got a PhD in anatomy um, with an emphasis in endocrinology because there was very little in the way of subspecialty endocrinology in those days. Uh, and then uh, ultimately finished the residency in um, uh, OBGYN at Columbia after a period of about seven years and uh, stayed on the full-time faculty uh, at uh, Columbia. I uh, had the opportunity to do so. I thought it was a wonderful opportunity for me at that time in my career uh, and that's you know how everything started in terms of my academic career. What was your area of special interest when you started on the faculty? Yeah, my interest was uh, in uh, reproductive endocrinology, uh, but with also uh, an interest in family planning, interestingly enough, uh, because family planning was just beginning uh, to uh, get started as a, as a real part of our uh, profession. Uh, and uh, obviously that became an important uh, uh, opportunity for me and was the focus of my research for many years. Uh, after I left uh, Columbia. Now, when did you leave Columbia? Left Columbia in 1968 and went to the University of Minnesota, where I was, uh, at a very really young age, was the head of the department there, uh, succeeding uh, John McKelvey, and uh, uh, stayed at Minnesota from 68 to 74, 75, when I relocated to Northwestern. I believe when you were in Minnesota was when you and I first met. Probably. And I think you had uh, a grant that you were working on in terms of uh, various types of uh, contraceptive or permanent right. sterilization. Right. 
Um, I had this large uh, award from the United States Agency for International Development, uh, and they were interested in the development of contraceptives that could be used in their uh, family planning programs in the developing world. And that uh, was called the Program for Applied Research on Fertility Regulation. It began in 1972, and uh, I transported it with me when I moved to uh, Northwestern, and that continued until 1984. So it was 12 years of, of work in uh, developing uh, contraceptives and contraceptive development. And uh, it was interesting because that's the time when I began to get involved in international activities because we did a lot of our uh, uh, initial work in other countries. We had developed a network of, uh, of family planning research people in different parts of the world. And so I began to interact with them and develop these associations which have then sort of carried me uh, uh, into so many other areas of, uh, of our specialty. When you left Minnesota, you became chair at Northwestern. Right. Northwestern, of course, has a tremendous amount of history with the American College of OBGYN. Yes. That's I succeeded uh, John Brewer as uh, chair, and he was a former president of the college, as you undoubtedly know, one of the early presidents. Uh, and. Uh, it was an interesting place at that time because we had three separate hospitals. We had Passifant Memorial Hospital, we had Wesley Memorial Hospital, and we had the Evanston Hospital. And they had three separate residency programs, and uh, uh, you know, my job was to try to unify the uh, department, uh, which I did, uh, and uh, we had the opportunity to move into a wonderful new hospital, new at that time. Uh, the Prentice Women's Hospital and Maternity Center. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was uh, really the start of the full-time faculty at Northwestern because Dr. Brewer, uh, as chairman, was a, a part-time and uh, supported himself primarily from a large uh, surgical practice. Uh, when I came as the full-time uh, uh, chairman of the department, um, one of my uh, uh, missions was to develop a full-time faculty for the new hospital, um, uh, which I did, uh, and uh, you know the department grew and uh, evolved uh, during those years. When you started putting that together, what were some of the major roadblocks that you uh, ran into? Well, I think the, uh, the uh, I don't know if we had roadblocks. But in those days, um, uh, recruitment, uh, well, I guess, suppose even today, re recruitment is, is difficult. Uh, but uh, recruitment was the major uh, problem because uh, I was interested in recruiting young people uh, with an academic interest that I hoped would become stars and superstars in the specialty. Uh, and so I spent a great deal of time in those uh, in the years looking for the right people for uh, the new department and um, uh, creating uh, basically subspecialty services uh, within, within the hospital. And there was, there was a, a lot of, I think, um, uh, concern uh, by the local practitioners as to whether the subspecialists uh, would uh, interfere with their uh, mode of practice uh, and their activities. Um, and uh, my job, I administratively, was to convince them uh, that the subspecialists would be complementary uh, to the uh, to the staff and not be competitive. And I spent a lot of time, uh, of my time, uh, you know, uh, translating this message for the uh, for the medical staff. As I recall, a number of those young faculty that you recruited have gone on to they become did. department chairs. <laughs> yes, they did. Uh, not only that, they've gone on to become department chairs, and many of them have already retired. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, one of them has come back to be the department chair, replacing you. That's right. Yes, Dr. Elias, who is the present uh, chair, was our first fellow, actually, in uh, genetics, and left in 1985 had a wonderful career in different institutions and then was recruited back to Northwestern uh, when I stepped down in 2003. 
Let's go back now. You mentioned that your first international activities were related to family planning. Could you tell us a little bit about what countries and what areas you were most involved with? Right. Um, well, what we were looking at, of course, was a family uh, um, contraceptives that would be of value uh, in evolving nations in the developing world. So these would be low-cost uh, uh, contraceptives uh, that could be um, distributed um, uh, by even non-medical personnel. Um, and these were vaginal contraceptives. We were looking at also uh, uh, intrauterine devices at that time, um, tubal sterilization procedures, uh, et cetera. And we had a wide uh, network, uh, actually from, uh, from Asia, from China and India, uh, to Africa, uh, and, uh, and in Europe, in several countries in, in Europe where we were doing various uh, clinical trials. And how did that get you interested in FIGO? Um, I think it was sort of a logical uh, follow-through because um, I was um, on the editorial board uh, of the International Journal of Gynecology and Obstetrics when it was edited by Harold Kamenetsky. And when Harold um, gave up the editorship to join the American College as one of the officers of the college, or one of the employees of the college, um, uh, they asked me to take on uh, the editorship. And as you know, that was the Figo Journal. The International Journal. So that was my first uh, contact with Figo in 1985. And at the same time, uh, Warren Pierce, who was the um, executive director, I guess, in your position, who was on the faculty in the Department of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology at Northwestern, uh, asked me to uh, become the uh, chairman of the Committee on International Affairs. That was the mid 80s. So uh, as the uh, editor of the journal and as the chair of the ACOG committee, I was the representative to the executive board of FIGO. And that was the beginning of my involvement. And that was in the mid 80s. And then things progressed very rapidly after that because it was in uh, 88 that I was uh, 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 selected as the president-elect of FIGO and became president in 91 and served from 91 to 94 at the time of our Congress in Montreal. And then, um, uh, and during this period of time, I was also editing the Figo Journal. So I was wearing two hats at that point. And then I became the program chair for the Congress in Copenhagen in 1997. Uh, and. Uh, and then served on the, continue to serve on the Scientific Program Committee for the Congress in Washington in uh, the year 2000. So, you know, that's my, the progression of my activities in FIGO. What would you have to define as your most memorable experience with FIGO? Well, I, uh, I think I had many, but uh, probably the uh, most uh, memorable experience uh, was uh, the opportunity to interact with the people on the executive board uh, that came from a variety of cultures uh, and uh, the, uh, the group was certainly not uh, unified in everything that they were interested in or wanted. And, uh, and my role was, was to try to sort of to guide this uh, group on the executive board to, uh, to do things that uh, I thought were important for uh, women's health uh, worldwide. Uh, and uh, in working with this group, I met a lot of very wonderful people. Uh, and I can mention some of them. Mahmoud Fatala was a, a great source of inspiration for me uh, because of his insight and because of his perspective, which was different from mine. He was come from a developing country, uh, and, but uh, had a wonderful perspective on where the uh, international organization uh, should be going. Sean Ratnam from uh, uh, Singapore uh, was a, a, a very important force at that time, particularly because of his interest in family planning. Uh, Ari Panati from uh, uh, Latin America also brought a different dimension 
to uh, the Figo scene, and I think interacting with uh, all of these people uh, was, as I look back on it, was uh, very important. And uh, as you say, these were memorable experiences. What would have been, on the opposite side, your most disappointing experience? Yes, I had many frustrations, I think, as, as president of FIGO. And uh, uh, in every organization, I think the leader always has frustrations. Um, uh, at that point, FIGO was a fairly um, diverse organization with offices in different places. Our treasurer was in um, uh, on the continental Europe in, in Switzerland. Um, the, the office was in London. People were scattered. And I had a uh, mandate to sort of bring everything together administratively into one unified organization. And it was very frustrating because it, it just seemed to take forever. Now, ultimately, uh, you know, now looking back on it, uh, what we started in those years ultimately worked out beautifully. And Figo now has a permanent home in London with a permanent staff, which we didn't have in my day. We had just you know one or two staff people in the office. They now have a full-time chief executive officer, which we didn't have in those days. So that uh, you know the things that we started, although I thought at the time they were terribly frustrating because it it just seemed to take forever. Um, what we started has worked out very well. What would you say would be one major change you would make in FIGO today if you had the power to make that change? Yeah, I suppose that, uh, you know, that's something that we could speculate on, but uh, I think one of the things that I would like to see is I would like to see th those countries that are not members of FIGO develop organizations that could uh, become uh, members of FIGO so that our educational mission could be expanded uh, to all of the countries in the world, not just those that are, are members of uh, FIGO presently. As you know, we have 113 countries now, and we will have over uh, 120 at the next meeting in Cape Town, but there's still many countries, uh, most of them small countries, most of them uh, countries that are uh, in the developing country uh, mode um, that should be members. And so if there's anything I could do, I'd like to bring them into the organization. Let's come back to our country, although today at our opening ceremonies, you're one of three presidents of FIGO that were in the audience. So I think that was uh, a unique time. Yes, probably. Especially. Um, let's talk more about our specialty, too. You've been very active in student teaching, resident recruitment, and developing our specialty. What do you see is the biggest problem our specialty is going to face in the near future? Well, I think that uh, you know, we have to realize that uh, the specialty is changing, uh, just like the world is changing. Uh, and that uh, our, our health care delivery system, particularly for women's health uh, issues, you know, has to change too. Uh, the uh, uh, present residency programs uh, were designed, uh, as you know, many years ago, and I think we have to continue to look at uh, resident education to make it relevant to the practice uh, today. Uh, and I, I do think that we're going to probably see more subspecialization uh, in our specialty, particularly in the minimally invasive surgery, and gynecologic endoscopy, an area that I'm interested in, in family planning uh, as another uh, subspecialty area. And, you know, there may be others that will evolve, but as the body of knowledge uh, in, in all these areas increases, um, and as the a time of uh, residency education seems to be getting uh, shorter and shorter because of the work hours. Um, I think we're going to see more subspecialization uh, in the specialty, and it pro probably will be a good thing. What other subspecialties? We know your gynecology is on the rim of becoming fully certified, but what other areas of our specialty do you see that would become uh, subspecialties? Um, well, uh, uh, urogynecology, of course, is already, uh, even though it isn't a, a formal um, a subspecialty, is already acknowledged as an informal subspecialty. 
Um, I would hope to see family planning, you know, follow in that uh, area as a as a recognized subspecialty. And as you've mentioned, uh, minimally invasive surgery, uh, and gynecologic surgery, is probably another logical uh, uh, area for subspecialization. How is this going to change our regular training program that we have today? Um, hard to know, um, but probably what will, uh, will happen is that individuals will identify areas of interest during their uh, residency and will begin to uh, 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 track toward uh, the subspecialty areas. And, uh, you know, hopefully it, it will be possible to do this without adding too many years uh, of training. In, uh, uh, for most of the subspecialties, it's three years plus our four years, so that's seven years. I, I wouldn't like to see it get any longer than that, uh, although, as you know, in the UK, training now has become longer because of the, very, of the shortened work hours. Uh, so I'd like to see us try to be creative in the way that we, we develop the sub, subspecialty training so that people could be subspecialized in a reasonable period of time. And I think seven years is probably a reasonable period of time. Do you think it's possible to modify our current training programs so that they could begin subspecialization at less than the four years, say at two years or three yes, years? Yes, well, you know, people have talked about this, and I think it's a good idea, and I think we should be, it should be possible to do it, but to, uh, at least in my experience, to change much in terms of residency education is like trying to move the Queen Mary uh, with your hands. It's a, uh, it's, it's a s slow process, and uh, uh, it will happen eventually, but uh, it's not going to happen right away. Well, let's take back. You are counseling a young medical student that's going into our specialty, or at least thinking about going into our specialty. What kind of advice would you give them? about our specialty? Yes, well, I think, first of all, I think that uh, you know, uh, individuals should do things that they really enjoy doing, because if you, if you select an area of something uh, that you really enjoy, it really isn't work. Uh, and as, you know, training in, in terms of, of, uh, of OBGYN is, is very intense, and it's, it's hard at best. So you have to really in, enjoy uh, you know, the area that you select and what you're doing. So that's the first uh, uh, advice I would give to anyone, um, you know, including my son, who's an anesthesiologist, you know. And, and uh, when I asked him why he wanted to go into anesthesiology, he gave me a, actually a pretty good answer. He said, you know, Dad, I want to take care of one patient at a time. That's what I enjoy doing. And uh, most of us end up taking care of many patients at a time, and that's what we enjoy doing. Let me ask a question. You were talking about uh, how we've changed and the process of uh, family planning, minimally invasive surgery, all that. During your lifetime in the specialty, what do you think has been the most significant changes that have taken place in our specialty? Well, um, you know, the, the obvious ones are the introduction of screening for uh, uh, cervical neoplasia. And that started in my uh, during my residency, the introduction of, of the oral contraceptives was an enormous change for women and for our, our specialty. And uh, of course, now we're seeing things like the, the, the vaccine to prevent uh, uh, cervical cancer um, and, uh, you know, and, and so many other things that have happened that rely on technology, such as the introduction of genetics and ultrasound and minimally invasive surgery. Uh, the specialty is totally different now from what it was in, you know, 1957 when I started my uh, experience in OBGYN. As a re result, do you think we should change our selection processes for residents in OBGYN? I think we should try to look for the best people that we can, uh, and uh, you know, and let them, uh, you know, move ahead and. And, and take the specialty to the next level. And what level is that? Well, you know, that's, a, that's a good question. But, uh, you know, again, uh, we don't know what medicine's going to be like uh, uh, 10 years from now. We can guess. 
uh, that you know genetics is going to become even more important than it is. Molecular biology is going to become uh, more important than it is in, in our specialty. And so I think we should have look for people with vision. Uh, one of the things that I uh, uh, was, was attracted to um, when uh, uh, I was a student at Columbia was Dr. Taylor really ha had a great vision for uh, our specialty. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was excited by that. Uh, he wasn't just interested in uh, gynecologic oncology, which was his subspecialty, but he had a great vision for uh, women's health, and obviously he carried this uh, through his whole career when he became president of FIGO and uh, editor of the uh, Gray Journal and all of the other things that he did. So he was a great role model for me, and I would like to think that some of us could be role models for the people that are, are coming after us. You indicated that you stepped down in, from the chair in 2003. What has been your role since that time? Well, actually, it's been a, a, a really a wonderful role. I'm now per, I'm professor emeritus now, but uh, I was on the full-time uh, faculty in the department from 2003 until last uh, summer. And I continued to see uh, patients. I continued to be, uh, you know, active in departmental activities. Uh, and so uh, I uh, didn't have to worry about the personnel problems. I didn't have to worry about the budgets. Uh, I could be involved in teaching. I could be involved in clinical care. And uh, so that was very nice. And now I'm Professor Emeritus, and I'm, without, I'm not seeing patients any longer, but I'm still doing some of the teaching, which I enjoy very much. Let me ask you a question. Northwestern is one of the institutions that has uh, pretty much uh, institutionalized the concept of the hospitalist in terms of medicine, in terms of their areas. We're now getting pressure in our specialty for the laborist or the person. How do you think that's going to fit into our specialty in the future? You know, everyone's talking about it, uh, and uh, it, it may be the way to go uh, because, you know, it's worked in other countries. Uh, certainly this is true in, in most of the industrialized world uh, where there are, you know, physicians that uh, basically work in hospitals and uh, there are physicians that work out of the hospitals. Uh, we're unique in that, uh, you know, for our, our practices have developed uh, so that uh, physicians take care of their own patients in the hospital. But um, when I see what's happened at Northwestern in the Department of Internal Medicine, where they uh, embraced this model of the hospitalist uh, a couple of years ago, it seems to be working very well. And uh, the patients seem to get excellent care. Uh, at first, the doctors, I think many of them were skeptical, but most of them now feel that uh, it's been a, an, an important and a positive uh, change. Uh, and that certainly, it, at least looking at it as a non-internist, it looks like the care uh, is better. Tell me what's going to happen at Northwestern. I understand that they now have a another brand new hospital. Well, yes. I mean, the, uh, when I came to Northwestern in 1975, we opened what was then a state-of-the-art new uh, hospital for women. And th this was supposed to um, uh, go until to 2016 was the, sort of the original plan. But uh, uh, we outgrew the hospital, actually, um, by the end of the last century. And um, the, the idea was, well, let's see if we could expand the building. We couldn't expand the building for uh, increased maternity services. So uh, the concept uh, was put forth, let's build a new hospital, which uh, some people thought was crazy at that time. It was in, in the late 90s, but uh, turned out to be a, a good decision. And the, the new hospital was, uh, start, we started planning it when I was the, the chair uh, in uh, about the uh, last couple of years of the last century, let's say. And uh, it was opened in 2007. Uh, and uh, they're now uh, at the point where 
They're doing 13,500 deliveries per year and a comparable number of uh, gynecologic operations. So it was, a, it was a really a good decision to do it. Uh, I think we were fortunate in that we had uh, a wealthy hospital that already had uh, uh, some equity that they could put toward the uh, building, but there was a big fundraising drive. They raised a million and a half dollars. They borrowed some money, and they you know, built a, uh, a half billion dollar, 17-story uh, uh, women's hospital. And now we're having a new children's hospital. It's being built next door, which will make it a women's and children's complex that I think will be spectacular. Has that made it easier to recruit residents? I think so in some ways. Uh, you know, I think uh, residents come to uh, institutions for a variety of reasons, not necessarily for the building. Um, I'd like to think they come because of the, of the program and the faculty and the opportunities uh, for career development. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think the, it's, it's nice to have nice real estate. That's true. <laughs> Especially in central uh, Chicago. Right, right. Well, Jack, it's been a real pleasure to sit here and talk to you, to learn about your career. You've had a remarkable career, and you are one of the giants in our specialty. Well, thank you for saying that, Ralph. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks thank for inviting you. me. Thank you.